Hello, oodles and my little poodles. We are back for another review, another goodly time talking about bookie McBookies. And as I mentioned in my last video, I wanted to continue on with the Foundling's Tale trilogy. So today I'm going to be reviewing book two. It's a cool cover, isn't it? dark it's ominous it's mysterious doesn't really tell you anything but it's kind of fun you know a lot of covers of books are quite monotonous especially in the fantasy realm we're getting more and more really interesting artwork on covers these days unfortunately books are so expensive sort of something i mentioned in my last video that not many people appreciate as much but i think it's actually become more and more of a premium thing. So covers and artwork as, as well are becoming such beautiful pieces. You know, it's not the kind of pretty lame stuff we used to get <laughs> 10, 15 years ago. So even this novel, which is actually quite old comparatively, is quite a nice piece of art, even though it is simplistic and stark, but that kind of fits in with the world. So if you have not checked out my review of book one, I would definitely go check that out. That is Foundling, part one of the series. I'll throw it up there. Uh, Lampletter definitely continues on in the same vein as book one. It is a very interesting take on a fantasy novel because this is not the kind of magic world with powers and abilities and magics going on it's very much more of a midi not even medieval i'm going way too far back victorian era steampunky weird mishmash of so many different things it is very much of the british bent uh, it is, I've mentioned this before, it is quite difficult as a North American speaker uh, of the English language to kind of follow along in this novel. There is so much slang being utilized, so many words. I don't know how many are being made up for this book and how much are actually from the English dictionary that was utilized, you know, 100, 200 years ago. But... It's quite a ride, and so I've mentioned this before, I wouldn't, depending on the moment, I wouldn't really put this novel in the YA sphere. It is in a certain sense because our main character is, I suppose, young enough to fit into that category, but at the same time, everything that's happening around him is, is not youthful in the slightest. Um, it, it is not something that a young person, especially someone who might be, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, is going to catch a lot of the times, just especially because of the language barrier. There's, there's a huge amount of detail in this novel. There's just so much going on. I mean, the lexicon itself is, let's see if I can find the exact spot. The lexicon, just this part, which doesn't seem like much, but it's in, fact, in effect it is, basically a hundred pages long of just explaining terms. Uh, the, the glossary is just very, very large and each term is quite complex in and of itself. It's not just a one line description of what this word means. Like you need a whole swath of a paragraph just to explain what a word means. And the, the novel does its best to kind of ease you into these things. At the beginning of each chapter, we sort of have a small explanation of what something is, what something might be, what it describes, that kind of stuff. So that helps a lot. But it's it's not a simple read. That's basically what I'm getting at. There's a lot of good action in this novel. There wasn't that much in book one, although there was quite a bit of things happening to our main character, Rosamund, in book one. But in book two, he is now officially in the lamplighter service. He is starting to go off on the, on the roads. He is lighting lamps as they are meant to do. And along the way, a shit ton of stuff happens to him. Of course, coincidentally, Rosemont happens to be in the right place at the right time to notice things that are going wrong, to be a part of events going wrong. There are attacks happening, there are monsters and bogles and knickers and all the different terminology that, that they use to describe 
effectively creatures in this world attacking and there's there's a lot happening right now of course we continue our adventures we're seeing europe who is the lazar the fulgar that we are introduced to in book one his, she has the ability to manipulate electricity these are this is probably one of the most interesting aspects of this series is the fact that we not only have that typical sort of victorian mishmash of steampunk with um I'm forgetting my words with rifles and muskets and all those older styled weaponry we also have people who have had surgeries done to them who have manipulated their organs and done things to their body so that they have the ability to produce things that normally would not be possible for an average human being so for a fulgar she's able to control and manipulate electricity from her body for a wit they can effectively send out pulses of telepathic pain i suppose you could say they can they can also find people using their abilities there's also leers who can sort of in conjunction with their abilities and these sort of masks that they wear they can sense out lies and be able to tell the truth and also kind of smell out knickers and bogles and other different things humans as well so they're really really good trackers and other things we have our scolds of course who do not have abilities they are effectively potion masters people who are really really great and whipping up different concoctions to be able to fight the monsters with and so that's really really interesting we have this kind of mishmash of all these odd and sometimes very violent and dangerous characters who are coming into the story at different points and showcasing off their abilities and of course our own rosamond our main character himself is i would say at the beginning stages of a scold himself he's learning how to utilize potives and all these kinds of things although he doesn't seem to be really that into it he's mainly focused on being a lamplighter and of course there is a other story going through the first two novels and of course it's going to bleed into book three where we are trying to figure out exactly what makes Rosamund different there's certain events that happen in this book that showcase that he's not a normal boy and the book ends off in a pretty good cliffhanger that effectively answers that question I find that was one thing DM Cornish didn't really do that well he didn't kind of keep the mystery of it I mean, you could already start to figure things out in book one. And by the time you're halfway through book two, you're like, oh, okay, he he is this. He's, he's not a normal person. And so it's going to be curious and interesting to see what happens in book three. I actually don't really remember what happens in book three. I do, not rem I do recall, excuse me, that there's a large amount more of the world that's introduced, this whole background, and I've mentioned this before, in my other review that I do recall being extremely frustrated because I know that there's a lot of other sort of side stories and back lore that's introduced that would lead into a wider world, a wider conflict, and we're sort of left hanging on that at the end of book three. But in terms of the actual story itself, there is a very tight linear path to Rosamund's story that, that is fulfilling and you don't you don't end the series wanting to shoot yourself, which is why I'm going to go back and finish off book three most definitely but if you just you're hesitant right now you finish book one maybe you're on the the fence you're not too sure well book two book two definitely adds in a lot more action a lot more adventure uh rosamond is 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 really having to push himself to understand really his place in the world in this book it's quite fun his interactions with europe are a little bit i don't want to say pointless but it's made out to be more than it actually seems to be in terms of actions and what's actually been happening between the two of them. So I'm not really sure why DM made it be such a big deal. I don't really know. He does get introduced. We do get another main character, so to speak, a side character, Threnody, who is a wit, who is someone who gets introduced and put together with Rosamond on quite an occasion and a friendship develop, develops between the two. We do not get a point of view from Threnody's character. You never get a point of view from anyone else except for Rosamond, which actually kind of benefits this story, I think, because there's so much other detail happening around that I think it would be a little bit overwhelming if we were also switching between characters and getting even more personal information about people. But who knows, I might be wrong, actually. It might have actually helped 
the unfurling of this story? I don't know. I, I've always felt very weird about this series. I enjoy it. I like it because it's so different. I think that's the main thing that I, I could say as a draw on for people. You will, n maybe not never, because obviously I have n I've not read every fantasy novel in existence, so there could be other books that are very similar to this, but for me, the style, who the main character is, how he's portrayed, the things he goes through, the pacing of the novel, it is very unique. There's not much else like it that I've read before, and it's something that's very difficult to read through but very satisfying due to the fact that there's all the, it's just odd <laughs> that's the best way to describe it it is it is an odd story it is strange and there's a lot of gobbledygook speak and things that are just thrown at you in detail and so there are, there are novels where the main character really pulls you through the story or main characters. Rosamond is not that fascinating of a character. He's kind of left unfulfilled, at least till the end of book two, because he's young and he's just trying to understand things and so much is happening to him that, I mean, he's he's interesting in and of, its, in of itself. He's, he's kind of interesting, but he's not this great emotional, Full character that pulls you in but the world is so odd <laughs> again I'm using that word it's the best way to describe it the world is just so interesting in that you wish you could explore it more that I think that's what really is the draw that's what pulls you through the entire novel and will most probably pull you through book three and will pull me again, since I've read this before, through book three, even though it's been probably 10 years since I read this book, this series. And I think that's also what, just have that expectation of also simultaneously being unfulfilled because you're, when you finish this trilogy, you're going to want to know more about the world. And very frustratingly, you're not gonna find that out. So just be prepared for that. Um, but I think it's worth it. I think this this is a great book to read as inspiration, especially if you're someone who likes just story. Um, I'm using the wrong word. World building, I suppose, would be the best way to describe it. If you're someone who just really, really likes ideas, who likes to see a world being crafted that could continue on its own, even without the story itself being there. That's what this is. This is a great world. Uh, and the story is adequate enough. It's good. It's fun. It has moments of good twists and enough interest. It... I'm struggling on this. I want to say, I really don't know how to describe Rosemond's character. Is he interesting? Is he great? <sighs> I think he's just a really great stand-in to help us navigate through this world and be confused with us. In and of itself, he just doesn't really give back enough, I feel, to the story that I care about him. But his backstory and what he represents itself is interesting as well. So he, as, as a person moving through the world and representing multiple sides of what's happening in these conflicts that are going on in the world i think he's he's a great stand-in he's not a really interesting person maybe that's a bit harsh i don't know this is this is the kind of novel where i just struggle to express what i'm feeling with it because it's you have to read it to understand so if you have not read book one i definitely recommend reading book one definitely read book two and just finish off book three because why not it's it's a it's a fascinating series dm cornish has managed to build something here that very few people manage to when i read most fantasy books i can always see where someone got something from and obviously a lot of this is definitely borrowed from our own history of the world especially british history but Everything that DM built around it and integrated into it is 
by far the oddest, <laughs> the oddest damn world I've ever read and experienced. And even though I've read this series multiple times over the years and then had a huge gap and came back to it, it still ha it leaves me with that same feeling of, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it, except to say that I will read it again, most probably in another, another couple of years, just because it just leaves me wanting more in a very strange way. Yeah, so sorry for that extremely unclear review. That's, that's all I got for you people. Let me know what you think down below. Like, comment, subscribe. Check out the website, details.ca. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Farewell.